I think those are some pretty good questions this week or this month. I say this week. What am I trying to do to myself? It takes a long time to put together these questions. It takes a lot to be able to have all of this content here. It's gotten easier as I've gotten the flow down, um, but it does take a number of hours for this is we used to just do questions. You just have to call in. Uh, and of course, the by the way, the lines are open. If you'd like to call in and talk about anything, it doesn't have to be Network Plus. It could be anything. It could be things that are in the news. It could be technology events. It could be whatever you happen to see online. You can call in. The numbers to call in are at professormesser.com slash live. So you will not see that on the feed here. I don't put those up because it's very time specific, of course, to be able to have that there. There is... Um, a number of things associated with this particular study group. And I think um, putting together the content's an important part of it, having the right things that are there. Uh, to have that there. Yes, there are CompTIA continuing education units you can get. I think you can get up to four units a year, or no, four units during the entire uh, renewal time uh, during that three year period. You can get one unit by watching this. If you'd like to send me an email at the top of the website, hit contact us. And in that list, uh, the secret code word for this month was OSPF. So you send me a, a link with that and OSPF in it, and you can absolutely have that there. So uh, that's I'll know what it is. Just You don't even have to put anything else in there. If you want to put something nice there, if you want to put something not nice there, that's fine. I, I, I won't respond to the not nice ones, but I will on the, on the nice ones that are, are there. Uh, okay, let's go straight to calls. We also got some questions that have come up in the chat, but let's go straight to the calls. I'll call out the... Uh, area code of 661, but as we've known, that may not exactly be the right area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Good morning. How are you doing, Professor? Is this Anthony? This is Anthony. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing this doing, morning? Doing fine. I got some emails from you this week, and I was a very bad host and did not reply to them in a very timely fashion, but this may be the time to bring it up. Yeah, I think I had... Um you had sent me an email and said that uh, you were getting ready to answer me and you lost me somewhere. And then what happened? What happened there? I'm very sorry. I don't know. <laughs> I apologize. I, that, that's no just, problem. In, a, in about a month or so, I hope to be able to tell you the stories of what had been going on here. And I think it will be very apparent now, but I can only grovel for your, for your forgiveness at this point. So, But maybe this oh, would be no, a good time to talk about it. Yeah. Um, I've been starting my computer in the morning. And I get this uh, pop-up with this um, command prompt, and uh, it says C colon backslash program file backslash search extensions Ooh. backslash client dot ex execution. Ooh. EX. Uh, how, how do you feel about that, Anthony? I kind of feel that somebody is trying to get into my computer. I think somebody is trying to get inside the side of your computer. Anytime somebody is messing with the the extensions or the fundamental configuration of a browser one has to be wondering and you are absolutely right to look at that and go wait a second that's that's not quite right one very common way for the bad guys to redirect you is to take over in your browser effectively hijack your browser it's called a browser hijack and they will take over aspects of the way your browser works one very common way is they will take over what search engine you go to or you search from. So we're very commonly going up into the title, the address bar of your browser, and you're typing in a search string, and you hit enter. And normally, whatever you define in your browser, such as Google, suddenly shows up on the screen and shows you the Google resort results. What the bad guys know is if they can redirect you to their front end, they can present their ads to you and get their money from you instead of you getting money over on the Google side. They can also track the things, of course, you're searching on and use that information to be able to get that there as well. So anytime I see especially command line screens popping up and running things, uh, it's, it's very, very questionable as to what might be going on. And you may want to go to uh, and do uh, whenever I get malware like this, or this may be more more properly categorized as adware. Um, one of the things I like to do is just nuke everything and restart. And I recognize that many people don't have that option. So there are a number of tools you can use to at least run through. Have you run through any anti-malware scanners to see if anything would pop up? Um, not yet. This has just started maybe within the last two weeks, something like that. And I've been going to MS Config trying to figure out where this came from. I've gone to... Um, uh, configure uh, 
Yeah, MS yep. Config. Yep. I've gone to uh, the task task sure. manager. Yep. Checking that. And um, I went up into the browser, and there was something that, you know, where I went to extensions, but it said, it, since it said extensions, I was thinking that it could be a process that's coming through uh, Google Chrome. Sure. Sure. And I was thinking about just, um, uh, what do you call it, just taking out Google Chrome, eliminate it, delete it, and then reinstall it again. Oh, but the bad guys know you would do that. And so whatever got it into Google Chrome in the first place is probably going to get it there after you remove it and, and try to come back. I'm going to give you okay. a listing of some um, some names of what what is really most people using. It's an anti-malware cocktail, if you will. It's a, it's a set of different programs. All of them do kind of different things, uh, but they are all focused on getting rid of malware. Interestingly enough, antivirus software isn't very good at getting rid of malware in all of these cases. And that's why I'm going to give you, first, you should absolutely have anti antivirus software running on your Windows device, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but yeah, here, here right. yep, good. So there are some things you, the one that probably is the most popular is one called Malware Bytes, B-Y-T-E-S. I'm sure the chat room is probably, uh, and you can get that at malwarebytes.org. I'm going to pop over so we can, See what this looks like if I can get it up on the screen. And there we go. So go to Malware Bytes. That's probably, I would bet, most of the time, Malware Bytes will find this. And if you're using this for personal use, it's absolutely free. They have a version you can purchase where it can provide you with more real time scanning. And you can run this in conjunction with your antivirus scanner as well. They do not conflict with each other. Um, and the free version, though, will give you an on demand scan. And you might find a lot of things popping up on this piece. It's a very good way to get rid of the bad things. And yep, the folks in the chat room are going, yep, I like the malware bites. That's a good one. And I agree. That's that's a very good one to go with. Uh, another well, one. Had, go uh, ahead. Uh -huh. Go ahead. What were you going to say? There's there's another one I want to also tell. I've got about four or five listed here uh, on this list. Did I just get rid of all my, my malware stuff? We need to undo whatever I just did. I'll give you another one that I've got in this list. Let me find my list of. Okay, now I got it back on my screen. Um, another good one is Combo Fix. Uh, now we're getting into more esoteric problems. When you run into a relatively new piece of malware and something that is just not getting itself corrected with anything else, with your antivirus or even with malware bytes, or even if you just want to run this as just another good one to run through. Uh, at bleepingcomputer.com is Combo Fix. And it is a, a very specialized program. It is updated quite often. And it can find things that are relatively new or in some cases relatively pervasive and clean them off of your machine. Um, it's, it's very useful to have this here. And again, in the chat room, some questions that have come up. Is the, the free version of Malwarebytes good enough? It's good enough if you don't need or don't want real-time uh, scanning of malware and free can only be used for personal use. If you are an organization, uh, your corporation, your business, you need the the pay for version. You can't uh, legally use that. Combo fix, and these will all, of course, somebody else asked if it work with Norton. It will run uh, alongside your antivirus just fine. You aren't going to find them conflicting with each other at all. And some folks in the chat room have said this. So combo fix is another one. I'll give you three others real quick just to sort of make this a little bit faster. Uh, the junkware removal tool. Not bad. I've run it. There's some nice functionality within that. Usually, you don't even have to get down to the third one here. Usually, you're done at malware bytes and combo fix. But that's also a good one to have in your repertoire so that you're able to pull something out that might solve a problem that nothing else does. Uh, the fourth one on my list is Super Anti Spyware, which has a remarkably cheesy website. Um, and I think it is mostly. Um, if it's the one I'm thinking about, I don't want to talk bad about them. And then, indeed, they have the best website ever. Um, nope, it's the one that's cheesy. I was I was right. Uh, Super Anti Spyware uh, at superantispyware.com is another relatively good anti spyware software. Um, and another one that is really focused on browsers is one called Toolbar Cleaner. Uh, and I'm not even sure I should really write down URLs. 
because now I have to spell things. Uh, toolbarcleaner.com. There you go. How hard was that? Uh, toolbarcleaner.com, a, a non-cheesy website, a nice website. Um, it really focuses on browsers and cleaning up the toolbar in a browser whenever it gets infected. So you will probably run through a number of of these things to be able to remove malware from your system but it certainly sounds like some type of bug has gotten on there but i'll bet i'll bet you get to, to malware bites and i bet it finds it and gets rid of it and i bet your your days are good uh, as always okay. back up what important files make sure you have things you don't know what's going to happen this these malware removal tools may remove the malware and then they also damage your boot sector and then you got to somehow get back into your system some people can't recover from something like that uh, although I know you can. So uh, you may be in better shape than most when it comes to these, but you never know how these are going to affect your system. You don't know what system files have been corrupted. When these anti-malware devices remove the bad files, they may not replace them with good files. So it may be up to you to resolve any problems that come from that and those pieces. But give those a shot. I will bet they'll solve a problem for you. Okay, I have malware bytes here. Yep. Humble fix. I have super anti spyware. I just need to get the junkware removal and the tool bar removal. The or junkware cleaner. removal tool and the toolbar cleaner dot com. Yeah. And also I I also have a C Clean. What do you think about that one? That one's really good for cleaning up ancillary files and configurations from applications. That tends to be something that cleans up legitimate programs rather than finding malware and getting rid of them. But I've used CCleaner myself a number of times on my Windows device. Um, I don't tend to run a lot of, of optimization cleaning, registry cleaning tools, because I think a number of them are really, really sketchy. Well, you shouldn't say a number of them are really, really sketchy. Most of them are really, really sketchy. But CCleaner is one that I've used people in the chat room have mentioned already. I've they they've used it. It's really good at getting rid of things, but you really need to be careful that some of these things you're getting rid of is what you really want to get rid of. In fact, on the the first C Cleaner page, they talk about uh, cleaning out of Internet Explorer the cookies. Well, cookies. Generally speaking, there's nothing wrong with cookies. Cookies actually can help no. you logging into sites. Okay. You don't have to remember usernames and passwords. Uh, but some people get rid of these things just so they can get rid of them and clear everything out of their system. Um, so you re really have to be careful what you're choosing in there. But CCleaner generally won't hurt anything on your system. It cleans off things that are optional. And if it does clean something off, it's very easy to recover from that after the case as well. So that's a, that's a good yeah, one to use. Usually, usually if you run CCleaner in safe mode, it won't uh, clean up everything in your registry. Right. That's a good, one, good way to do it. That's a, a really nice feature of that product, in fact. Safe mode and anti anti spyware combo fix won't run in safe mode. No, I don't think it will. I don't no. think that one yeah, will. It's doing a lot of good anti stuff. Anti spyware won't. Yeah, some of these need to have the full blown operating system up and running because it's using some of those APIs and system calls that are only available when it's a full blown system. So hopefully you will be able to resolve the malware before it gets to a point where it doesn't allow you to run a regular operating system install. Operating system. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. I learned uh, quite a bit from you today in this networking. I'm um, um, looking at this binary to decimal. I'm going to start working on that and studying that and watch your videos on that because that's very interesting. The binary to decimal, interestingly enough, is going to help you whether you go into networking. It's going to help you if you go into programming. It's going to help you if you go into server administration. It comes in handy in so many places, and it's so easy. Yeah, You look at it like, oh, binary is going to be really, really hard. turns out it's nothing to it. Very simple. Okay, thank you. You have a good good weekend. Thanks, Anthony. Good talking to you. I'll be better about replying to your emails, and let me know how all of your scanning goes. I'd love to find out if okay. there was anything on there. Okay, thank you very much. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. It's a lot to consider when you get into working with malware. My, my overall large scope perspective of this, and I've worked with malware. I used to work for a very large antivirus company that if I named them, you would absolutely know who it is. Uh, used to work there and got certified across the board in antivirus. And at the time we were doing encryption and firewalls and a ton of security. The company's still around. Um, and, and removing the malware 
is the hardest thing because it embeds itself so well in the operating system. It hides itself so well. Um, and that my my number one rule is just nuke the operating system. Get all your documents off of it. Erase everything. Reinstall. Put them back. That is the only 100% absolutely sure way that you can be 100% sure the malware is gone. There's there's no way to do this. And I know that a number of you will tell me, no, I put anti-malware uh, anti -malware on here, like malware bytes. I use combo fix. I got rid of it. And I, and I bet most of the time you do. I bet a lot of the time you do. But you can't ever be 100% sure that you did. That's the problem is the 100% part. The only 100% way. And yeah, good example in the chat room, Robert's saying, that Microsoft called me and said I had a problem on my computer, but that's just a scam. There's so many ways the bad guys are using. They are they are using the phone to fish you, uh, which is over voice. Which, if you take your Network Plus certification, is called vishing or voice phishing because we needed a bad word to to use for that. Just a horribly sounding dumb name to sound for that. Let's let's go back to the calls. Again, 559 area code. What's your name, caller? Hi, I'm Jessica. Hello, Jessica. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you today? So I guess my question is um, a little bit, it goes along with what we're talking about. But So I had an interview um, last week, and I just found out yesterday that she said it was super, super close, but I just didn't demonstrate my technical skill very well. Oh. Um, but I'm the person in the, you know, in the in the group that everybody comes to for help when it comes to anything with computers. And I just felt like, man, I know I have the technical skill, but I guess I just don't really know how to describe that I have it. There you go. I think that is that is a critical piece of the interview process. And one, I, I went through an interview a number of years ago uh, where I sat down with a startup. And I, I, I'm someone who I feel like I know things to, to a certain point. I've had a number of projects I've worked on. I have a number of things I've done personally. But I, but I thought back to the interview and I thought I really did not tell them about much of these things. I think part of my problem is I'm one of these people that – I'm I'm very I'm very quiet that way. I don't like to toot my horn, as as I'm saying, of course, on a an internet chat uh, show that I'm running myself. But I'm, I'm I really am someone who who likes to not say a lot of those things in that way whenever I'm I'm in front of somebody. But that is exactly what you should be doing, and you should make a list of all of these things that you've worked on. Ideally. Put them inside a particular project. So if you're able to walk in and say, yes, in fact, there was a big project we just did where we converted antivirus manufacturers from one to the other, and here's the process we went through. Or uh, had a problem uh, oh, last week, it was very uh, detailed, and here's the problem we ran into was with a hard drive, and it was a malware infection, and here's what we did to solve it. That's what the people during the interview are looking for, because I can also almost guarantee you that half the time, the people you're talking to are not going to be as technical as you. They're hiring someone technical. In fact, they're probably going to tell you when they bring in the technical person to see, is she really telling me the truth? Because I'm not really, I don't understand any of this stuff. Um, so you, so you want to have that list available. And then the other side of that is you have to have something to put on the list. If you have not worked in a corporate environment before, or you haven't had an opportunity to have a project like that before, do it yourself. You have computers at home. You have things that you've set up. You've, in fact, I gave you some examples today of popping up, starting up Wireshark, pop it open, connect to a website. Now examine the conversation you had from one site to the other. And you may find that there are things inside of that conversation you should be doing differently. Maybe it's about encryption. And you could talk about installing uh, these specialized encryption extensions into your browser that every time you go to Google, every time you go to Facebook, every time you go to any website, it automatically converts that to an encrypted link. And you confirm that it was working because you were able to use Wireshark to do that and get that's what the employers are looking for, is somebody who has that knowledge of what's going on. And if they ask you, have you worked at all with encryption? Yeah, I've done a little bit on my desktop, sure. 
You know, that's that's yeah, not okay. that's not what they're looking for. They want the story. You have to become a storyteller in your interview. And even if it is the most, it sounds like to you the dumbest thing, like like having to load an, a, an extension into a browser and capturing packets to you sounds like, of course I did that. That's so easy. That's so simple. But that's what they're looking for is that you have the thought process because they go, well, she can do that on her system in her browser with that extension. She can easily do it on this important application we're using here internally. That's what they're trying to make the link. And it's not up to you to necessarily to make the link. It's up to you to tell the story. So I would recommend writing down at least three or four uh, well, just large area topics. And you can probably think back to this interview you just had. They asked me about antivirus, or they asked me about Microsoft operating systems, or they asked me about Ethernet networking. You should come up with a story for each one of those and have that ready to go when you walk in the door so that you can explain to them, I'm the smart person that you have indeed been looking for. This should not even been close. I should blow away whoever you're talking to because here's the story that I have. I'm sort of saying that in my head. Don't say that out loud to the person who's interviewing. But, <laughs> But say that in your head and then tell them the story about the things that you do, even if they are as as odd and seemingly benign and boring to you. It's remarkable how important that is to get across to the person interviewing you. Great. Um, I just it comes from me because I've not really had a uh, an IT job before. I've always been like an administrative assistant or something along the lines that really didn't internally show that I have dealt with IT, but just from college experience and um, other backgrounds. So this is one of the things that I think uh, this comes up a lot. If you if you go through uh, some of the IT threads on Reddit. Um, someone will be a technical person. They're in charge of managing all of the router switches and firewalls for their organization. They are the lead engineer. They got the job a month ago. And what they put into their, their messages on Reddit, the reason they're posting this is they say, I feel like I'm an imposter. I feel like I really should not be here in this job because I know the bare minimum to do this particular position. And I feel like I really shouldn't be here. And it's remarkable how pervasive that feeling is in the industry even for someone who walks in I, I walk in and talk to professionals all the time about things and they're asking me about technologies i've never heard of before and you have to get accustomed to saying a couple of things you have to get accustomed to saying i have no idea what you're talking about tell me more about what that is and then applying it to other technologies you've worked for or when you're first getting into technology and you're first that you're that router guy or the switch guy of course you don't know everything there is to know about that you're never going to know everything there is to know about anything. You're always going to be working towards and learning more throughout your entire career. So also don't feel that even if you're going from uh, administrative assistant to networking or to help desk or to server administration or to data center management, everybody is. I used to work in a video when they used to rent videos from stores back in the day. I used to work in a video rental store. I used to work out in the fields hoeing a blueberry field uh, for a living. Um, I used to do a lot of things that had nothing to do with technology. I could. I, why am I sitting here behind this microphone? That doesn't even make sense to me. But everybody goes through that process. Everybody has been through that. I used People used to work at a fast food. They used to have a position at a library. They used to work with something uh, driving a truck. I get these emails all the time from people that are transitioning from one thing to another. And you just want to have the stories there and have make them understand that even if you've never had an IT position before, look at all the things you've done with technology people who work in IT know that this is where we come from and they understand that concept. So once you get those stories, get your certification in your pocket, walk in the door and be very straight in looking at somebody's eye and telling them that story, it goes a long way. Awesome. Good luck with that. And let us, let us know how the next interview goes. I want to hear the follow-up story on the next time and, and get some good stories together. Definitely. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling. All right. Bye-bye. There is the interview process is such a mysterious beast um, and being able to step through the process and work it. It's everything. It's from how you dress. We could have arguments right now of how you dress when you go into an interview. Um, you should be the best dressed person in that interview. I'm not talking about a bow tie and, and tails. I'm talking about and a white hat, top hat. Uh, you should you should be nicely dressed, even if it's a casual environment. 
I don't like to wear socks, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on some nice socks and shoes when I go to an interview. Of course, I want to be the best dressed there. Um, we could have conversations about how to sit in the interview in your chair, how you're how you should talk to people and look them in the eye. There's a whole set of skills associated with that and plenty of things um, to discuss as well. Uh, 661 Erico Code has been holding for a while. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Uh, yes, hello, this is Alex. Hello, Alex. How are you, sir? What can we do uh, for you? Uh, I'm currently wondering a bit more about, uh, you were talking about uh, decimal binary earlier on. I was. Uh, could you please elaborate a bit more on, uh, um, what's it called again? Uh, you have uh, binary decimal and then you have hexadecimal. Yes. There, in fact, the hexadecimal is one. I find that a bit, uh, I've, I've understood the basics of uh, decimal binary, but uh, hexadecimal seems a bit more tricky. And the use for hexadecimal, uh, could you elaborate a bit more on that? Absolutely. Um, for for first, for those of you that, that are listening and for those of you that are working on your Network Plus certification, you don't need to know in the Network Plus breakdown of how to do any hexadecimal to, to decimal or binary conversions. You don't have to know how to do that conversion necessarily. Um, it's interesting, though, how we use hexadecimal. And I think we're going to see more people. In fact, I'm, I'm wondering if the next Network Plus may slide us into that, because obviously with IP version 6, all of the addresses are in hexadecimal. So this is this is one of those things where why are we even using hexadecimal? It's a base 16. I can count to 10 on my fingers. In fact, binary, I can sort of understand because it's a 1 and 2. But a, a numbering system that uses 16s and then goes into the next round of 16 doesn't even make sense to me as a human being. Um, and of course, it, that's probably because it's all computer related. We know that computers work on these bits that uh, you take four bits and you've got a nibble, they call it. Uh, eight bits is a byte. Um, and there's ways that are easier to represent this grouping of ones and zeros that may not necessarily be easy to group and, and display as a decimal number. It may be easier to do a conversion and represent those numbers and those values as hexadecimal. So I don't necessarily have any conversion charts available immediately right now that have anything to convert back and forth. But that's why you usually see a hexadecimal number written with not just numbers, but there's letters in there as well. Because in hexadecimal, you're going 0 through 9, and then you go to A, B, C, D, and E, and F. And there you've got your 16 characters that you can pull from. Awfully confusing. Okay to us human beings to figure that out. But the reason we write things in hexadecimal sometimes is it's actually easier to represent on the screen rather than doing ones and zeros, and sometimes easier than using decimal numbers, interestingly enough. And when we start getting into IPv6, it's really the case. I wonder if I can, I know you won't be able to see this on the screen, and you'll see it late on the feed. But I have a number of things I was just doing with hexadecimal that, of course, are top secret that I can't tell you about. But I, I'm trying to find some of the things I was working on that are around hexadecimal. Um, you often see hexadecimal numbers written with a 0x in front of them. And if you're talking to somebody and you're explaining, well, here's the error code I got. And on your screen, it says AF34. That looks like hexadecimal. We usually will say out loud 0x AF34, just so whoever we're talking to understands that's hexadecimal. In fact, if you're writing it down on a piece of paper or seeing it on the screen, you'll almost always see 0x in front of it to represent that as a hexadecimal number so that everybody understands that's not decimal. Because you could see a number that says 09. Was that 09 in decimal? Is that 09 in hexadecimal? It could be either one. Um, so it's important to, to make that consideration. When you get into IPv6, you're going to be doing a lot with hexadecimal. And I'm trying to get into my IPv6 information on my screen to try to break this out. And I'm, I just don't have anything on the screen to show you. You're, I'm going to have to make this for the next study group because I think this is a good topic. Because when we get into doing IPv6, there's a functionality in IPv6 where you can take a MAC address of a device and you can convert it and turn it into an IP, 
part of an IPv6 address that's unique, that's a link local address. It's sort of like APIPA in the IPv4 world. And it requires that you do one little tiny change to the address. You convert it from hexadecimal, which is what a MAC address is, into binary. You flip a bit, and then you convert it back to hexadecimal. And if you've never done the conversion before, it looks like it'd be awfully hard to do. But it is remarkably easy when you start getting into it. I just don't have anything to show you along those lines because it's not part of the Network Plus requirements, at least not at the moment. Um, so if you're yeah, because uh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry for interrupting. No, please but, do. Uh, I'm actually I'm actually doing a Network uh, Plus class right now, and uh, uh, we were talking about. Uh, what you just mentioned, IPv4 to yes. start off with. Yep. And the fact that we're kind of running out of IP addresses. Oh, yes. So we need a new system, and that system is IPv4. And if I understand it correctly, IPv4 is a 32-bit address, and IPv6 is 128-bit. Much bigger. Um, uh, it's bigger, okay. Uh, um and my teacher is talking about he has he he struggled a lot with actually learning this uh, conversion table for himself. Right. But he mentioned to me that you could put zero through nine uh, and A to F. That's that, it. That's like what fifteen or sixteen is it? It'd be sixteen, 16 characters. different he, symbols or always count your zero. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and he mentioned that if you start off uh, with a with a nibble which is half of a byte, you can basically, if you start to the far right in the table, you can type uh, 001, and to the far right, you can skip each and every character because it's uh, uh, the number one, because yes. the nibble is one, yep. two, four, eight, from the right to the left. And you can basically make this table go like uh, in the, in the uh, far right of the <laughs> uh, nibble, you can go like zero one, zero one, all the way down, and then you just double in the next table, uh, zero zero one one, zero zero one one, etc. Yep. And then you can do number three, four zeros, four ones, all the way down to the end. And on the far left, it's like uh, eight zeros and then eight ones. Since there's only sixteen find, things there, you can almost build the chart out for those four bits to be able to determine yeah. if these four bits are there. What does this turn out to be? Yep. Exactly. And if you were to look and, at an uh, IPv6 address, I have it up on my screen, uh, and you'll be able to see this in the replay. So I take one of those values. This is hexadecimal FE80. What this is, is mm -hmm. the F is the first four bits, the E is the next four bits, the 8 is the next four bits, and the 0 is the next four bits. And if we do our binary exactly. conversion, you can almost see very easily these 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 four bits here, 1, 0, 0, 0. If we go back to our binary conversion chart, that turns out to be 8. And when you run into a problem is when you go 1, 1, 1, 1, and you look at the decimal number and realize, well, wait, that's that's not that's 16. That's not what I'm shooting for for this. But 16 yeah. in hex is an F, and that's where we're getting the F from. So that is the counting process is using those four bits to make it happen. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, like one of my one of my big ponders with with hexadecimals is. Uh, what other usage can you use it for except IPv4? <laughs> I mean, IPv6. Well, this is uh, one of the things that you'll often find is things like memory addresses are very often described in hexadecimal. Uh, certainly, tons mm -hmm. of IPv6 are hexadecimal. When you start working with applications and where applications have things in memory, you'll start working with hexadecimal. Um, there are cases, or practically anything in programming is all done in hex whenever you're trying to describe functionalities of the application, certainly memory addresses of where it is. Uh, the If you look at the I.O. addresses, the input-output addresses that are defined for interface cards in your device, and you go to your device manager in Windows and look at the details of a piece of hardware, all of the I.O. addresses are listed in hexadecimal. So it's not just going to be IPv6 you run into, but you'll see all of these. I, I have a okay. kind of a, this is where I have to draw lines whenever I'm putting together this, 
material on my website because I would love to show everybody how to do these uh, binary to decimal to hexadecimal conversions. But I look at the 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 network plus certification requirements and the objectives ha don't really don't really have that functionality in there. And so I'm building mm -hmm. videos mm -hmm. that are designed to be the exact perfect fit for the cert. But on the other side of this, I think well, knowing this is really useful to what you're doing later on in your career. So I, I have this big list of technology that I would love to put into this video series, but then it would end up being twice as long. And at the end of the day, you're not going to get a question on your Network Plus exam that asks you to do a hexadecimal conversion, at least not yet. If they do add it, I'm absolutely adding that to my video series, but they just aren't yet. Okay, so what you're saying is that it's, it's a bit off topic in regards well, to the uh, M plus exam requirements, yes. but it's useful. It may be useful to know either way. It, it will so, be useful okay. to know either way. It absolutely does. It kind of makes more sense when you look at IPv6 if you know how they got those letters on the screen. Yeah, exactly. Well, yep. thank you very much, Professor Messer. I really enjoy your show, your video series. I find it very, very convenient. Uh, towards uh, uh, learning more about networking and the uh, N+. Plus. That's great to hear. Thank you for calling, Alex, and uh, let us know if other topics come up that certainly I should be considering putting into those videos. I will. Thank you very much. Take care. Goodbye. It is uh, 46 minutes after the hour. We've had a very long after show <laughs> to that piece. Um, there is... Um, Quite a bit. In fact, it's interesting the whole hexadecimal conversion came up because I was going through that this week. I'm putting together a new video series um, or, an, or I guess more of an updated video series. And I got to IPv6 and I thought, do I really want to go into the hexadecimal part of this? It is it's one of those where I have to draw the line and it's painful to draw the line. Sometimes I could talk about OSPF for hours. I could talk about BGP for hours, but on the network plus it's a slide. It's, it's two slides, you know, when you get into it and we're talking about it for 10 minutes. Um, it's a challenge. IPsec, we could go for days talking about IPsec and the way it works and how people use it and where it's structured and where you run into problems. And how do you troubleshoot it? And what do you expect to see on the other side? There's there's certificate certificates is another piece of it uh, for SSL. Um, we just have to draw the line somewhere when we're putting these things through. And unfortunately, that's one of those things that gets gets drawn. I think, yeah, sort of a bonus series is a is a not a bad idea. Actually, I think it's going to take care of itself. Um, so there are there are a number of things I mentioned that I I keep saying I can't talk about. I really shouldn't mention them at all. But there are a number of things happening that will allow me to do some more of these advanced topics and apply them to something that might be really useful. So there's a there's a vague reference to something that makes no sense if you're not sitting in my seat. So there's there's at least something that might might help with those those pieces of this. Um, Phone lines are open at least for a few more minutes. We've got about 10 minutes left before we step through the other pieces of this. In the chat room, I, I, the bonus series is certainly a good idea uh, when I finish all this certification-specific content. That's hilarious. Um, and some folks in the chat room talking about IDLE, uh, ITIL, the infrastructure library, the ITIL pieces. There's been a lot of talk about IDLE lately. I think most people are looking at doing the the uh, Information Technology Infrastructure Library, which nobody calls it anymore. Everybody just calls it IDLE. Uh, it's sort of become a name that they've called because it was an abbreviation, except that's now the name of it. Um, the This is all about processes and procedures. ITIL has nothing technical in it whatsoever, which means when people are moving from technology into more of a managerial position or decision-making position, it's helpful to have structure. And uh, the IDLE Foundation is one that provides that structure of how you would go about um, things like qualification of, of, um, of statistics and metrics and being able to determine what you should do next for your business based on metrics that are occurring on the technology side. It's blending together the technology and the business side to really use IT in its best possible way. Um, there is a lot we could talk about idle. I used to write 
a lot of idle content uh, and talk about how it blends back in the technology side. But I don't really have too much of a call for it on my website now. It is a very specific set of technologies or, or structured formats uh, of processes and procedures. And um, I just don't know that it applies to what I'm doing now. A lot of people said, I would love to get some idle certification videos. And I just don't know that the, the viewership would be there for what I want to be able to do. But they'd be really interesting because I've done a ton of work along those lines. It'd be interesting to have that that there. I don't have a release date for my mystery content yet because it's just a mystery, isn't it? Got to got to leave you wanting something and there's some stuff happening. There's there's all kinds of things happening over here. Um I do plan on having some additional content later this year. Uh so there is quite a bit going on those sides and um and maybe some really interesting things. We'll have to see. We'll have to see where this goes. Uh the more I think that I'm going to be ready to tell you something next week, it keeps or next month, it keeps being pushed a month after that. So I'll just keep it very vague for now. Stay tuned. There, there will be things coming. It will be very interesting. Hopefully, you'll be able to, to use that there, that there with those pieces. Um, another question in from the chat room. Is it uh, good to have some experience in the basics before getting into the security field? I think if you're interested in security, one of the best things you can do is to get knowledge in networking. And, and this is sort of a very broad brush that I'm painting here. But um, I currently do a lot in the security field. And everybody I work with, or, or the large majority of people I work with, I should say, um, are people that came through the networking piece because there's so much networking and security. And you, you often don't think that. You think security is about malware and it's about uh, resolving problems with the way applications are written with buffer overflows and database injections. But interestingly enough, there is a lot of network, network, network in the security side. Now, I will say I've worked with security people that came from application development. They came from server administration. This isn't just a, 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 a one size fits all. We get security people from everywhere. But I would say the majority of security people I work with are on the network side because they're implementing firewalls. They're implementing intrusion prevention systems. They're tightening down and understanding traffic flows. And you do almost have to have some knowledge in how operating systems work. You have to have also additional knowledge in how protocols communicate across the network. And it does help if you understand SQL so that you can understand what a SQL ejection is, so you can understand how it communicates back and forth to a database server. So networking is sort of the foundation of security. And then we tend to build our other security skills on top of that to be able to understand certifi certificates and having our own certificate authority in our environment, how to manage that properly, and how do we implement encryption for our application applications? And how do we manage that encryption as it flows to the network? What do we do with these certificates? How do we protect them? How do we secure them? How do we encrypt our email? You know, the, All of these questions now, do we do multi-factor authentication? What method of multi-factor authentication do we use? All of this has that foundation in, um, in our, our networking side. So if somebody just very broadly asks like this one, what do I need to do to start in security? My answer is going to be go start in networking and blend yourself into security. I think it's easier to go that route. It's not the only route, but I think it's one of the best ones you can do. Um, uh, other uh, There's a lot of security questions also in the chat room. Um, and I, I, I think there's, there's a great opportunity for more security videos. I think there's a mo more opportunity for more networking videos. I agree with all of you. And I think we should have more of those. And I'm, I would love to do more of those. I would like more time in the day. So, so I could do more of those in those pieces. And I think that works well. That gets into, um, even if you're trying to do a manufacturer's specific certification, you get into those questions about, do I need a home lab? Do I, what will this home lab look like? Should I do everything virtually? There's a lot of virtual options these days. What are the advantages and disadvantages between those? Um, there's a lot of, of conversations we can have about those pieces. Very, very useful to have those there. And, uh, I think that's one of those things we should just work on. Well, we've come to the end of yet another uh, monthly Network Plus study group, and it's been fantastic. I, I want to 
thank everyone for attending folks in the chat room uh talking about uh the the questions that we have i love the new format you've told me you like it too we're just going to keep doing sort of the pop quiz side of things and then we'll take phone calls into that piece as well i think it's really worked out quite nicely to be able to have that there uh, there's a lot more coming as i mentioned stay tuned over the next weeks and months there's a lot of new things that will be introduced and a lot of new things we're going to be doing here at master studios i want to make sure that you are able to take advantage of those things as well and as we have more things to announce we will absolutely do that thanks for joining us we've got a lot more to do next month as well. You can follow us on professormesser.com slash calendar, and I'll get the new dates up for next month as soon as possible. And until then, we'll see you. Thanks for joining us on our Network Plus Steady Group. See you next time, everyone.